you're never just a victim of circumstances. No matter what happens, you're never without options that can get you back on track. It takes courage to recognize that because it means accepting responsibility for your own future. But I would suggest that we should accept that responsibility because no one is really going to accept it for us, no matter what we may have been led to believe. Let me emphasize that underlying most fear is the fear of helplessness, of being victimized or being blown around by the winds of fate like a leaf is blown off a tree. But is that really a legitimate way of looking at things? To me it sounds like being afraid of the dark, in which case the best thing to do is to get yourself up, out of bed, and switch on the light. After all, the people who built this country didn't feel helpless when they faced obstacles that we can hardly even imagine today. I'm not saying we should all just gather around the campfire and tell stories about George Washington, but we should realize that every generation has faced insecurities and lived with them and triumphed over them. It's only in the past 50 years or so people have come to expect a life without real tough times and real difficulties. But adversity isn't something to fear, it's something to expect, something to prepare for, and something to overcome. The truly courageous person is not immune to fear, but it plays a different role in his or her life than it does for other people. If you're a courageous person, your fears aren't about what someone might do to you or something that might happen to you. Your fears are about not living up to your ideal, about reacting instead of acting, about not taking advantage of the opportunities that are always within reach. A truly courageous person is not afraid of what might or might not happen next week or next year. He fears not making the most of every moment today. A truly courageous person fears the impulse to dominate other people. She leads by helping others to be their best. A truly courageous person fears doing anything that he or his loved ones might be ashamed of. A truly courageous person fears making appearances more important than reality, making impressions more important than communication making himself more important than those who are depending on him. But there's one thing a courageous person fears most. Have you ever seen a deer caught in the headlights of a car, the way the deer just stands there as though paralyzed with the car bearing down? The truly courageous person fears ever getting caught like that, and a constant part of his or her life is dedicated to making sure it never happens. In other words, the truly courageous person, as someone once said, fears nothing except fear itself. Honesty and integrity are two qualities of a strong character that are fairly easy to define. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Do what you say you are going to do when you say you're going to do it. That's integrity. A clear correspondence between word and deed. Don't lie, tell the truth. That's honesty. Despite the fact that these are some of the clearest, most easily recognized elements of strong character, in the real world, they're also some of the most difficult to find. It seems it's always been that way. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Demosthenes went searching for an honest man and he never found one. I've been fortunate. I think I've known a great many honest people, but if I measured that number up against all the less than ethical people I've encountered, I guess I'd have to admit that even in my experience, honesty and integrity are rather rare. Why is that? I hope to provide some answers, but just as our discussion of courage began with a look at fear, I want to start talking about honesty by looking at the exact opposite of honest behavior. There was a time when telling a lie was very serious business. I'm speaking now of the days before lawsuits 
and legally enforceable contract. In those days, lying was a very serious matter. It was also very serious if you accused someone of lying. Today, a breach of integrity in a business matter might mean calling in the lawyers. But for hundreds of years in the past, calling someone a liar was the most common way to provoke a duel, at first with swords, later with pistols. Dishonesty was treated like a personal insult that demanded immediate redress. Everyone knew the big problems that could result if you got caught, so lying to another person took a certain amount of, what's the right word, foolish bravery maybe. But there's no such risk today, is there? Some people lie all the time without thinking about it. Most people know when they're being lied to, which they may find irritating, but they just accept it. Maybe they decide to become liars themselves. In any case, very few duels are being fought. To explain this, I think we can make a comparison between how some people today feel about lying and how they feel about money. It used to be you either had money or you didn't. When you bought something and the bill came, you had to pay it or there was an immediate problem. There were only two alternatives. You took care of your debt or you were a thief. Some people would literally take their own lives if they couldn't honor their debt. I'm sure we agree that's not exactly true any longer. Many people don't feel the same kind of personal responsibility about paying debts promptly. And today, of course, we can put off paying for our purchases as long as we can make the minimum payment on our credit card. That pain that comes with having to shell out hard cash for something, the pain of maybe having to give something up in order to have this thing, we can avoid that pain. We can put it off indefinitely as plastic debt. Of course, there's going to be a high rate of interest on that debt, and the balance due can quickly mount up, but most people don't even think about that. It's a price they're willing to pay in order to have exactly what they want right now. There are many situations where it's painful to tell the truth. It's painful in just the same way that paying a big fat bill is painful. In fact, we even use the same words to talk about paying debt and telling the truth. We may talk about somebody's word being like money in the bank. We talk about being held accountable, about having to account for yourself, about being called to account. If you've done something that you're really not proud of and you're called to account for it, well, what does that feel like? How do you handle it? What are your options when you've got to explain something that makes you uncomfortable? Well, it's a bit like that moment of decision when the credit card bill comes every month. If you want to pay off the whole balance, there may be some pain and sacrifice involved. You may have to grit your teeth. You know that your life will be simpler in the long run, but it's going to hurt a little right now to pay off the new golf clubs or the new computer. Or how about the 60-foot yacht? I don't actually know if you can put a yacht on a credit card, but I've certainly known people who would if they could. Gritting your teeth and paying in full can hurt. So quite often it seems easier to pay the minimum and delay the pain until next month. It's easier to float the truth of your finances off into a little imaginary plastic flying carpet and sail it into the mailbox. Of course, it's not really a flying carpet. It's more like a boomerang that's going to come around and hit you in the back of the head someday. But as Scarlett O'Hara once said, I guess I'll think about that tomorrow. For the time being, it's gone with the wind. Let me give you some good advice about avoiding a bankrupt character. Pay your ethical debt. Keep your integrity in the black. Face ugly realities with the truth as soon as they appear. When you feel that temptation to hedge, resist it immediately. Don't treat it casually. Treat it like a grease fire in the kitchen that you've got to put out before it burns your house down or fills the whole place up with so much smoke that you can't see where you're going anymore. 
because that's exactly what will happen when your ethical capital runs out. You just won't be able to see where you're going anymore. Here's another way that being untruthful is like buying on credit. They're both addictive. At first, they both go down so easy and they leave you wanting more. Any addictive behavior offers a simple short-term escape from a problem. But that escape becomes more and more complicated as time goes on. Lying can get extremely complicated. You've really got to have an outstanding memory to be a good liar because you're always having to create more lies that are consistent with the one you told in the first place. I'm sure we have at some time been caught up in a dilemma like that. Shakespeare had it right all along. What a tangled web we weave when at first we practice to deceive. Maybe you think I'm being a bit tough here. Am I really saying that in every instance you've got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So if somebody asks me, how are you today? I'm supposed to say, well, I got to be honest with you. I have a sore finger. Last night I had a headache and I've got to admit that my foot hurts a little. No, that's not what I mean. In fact, I think there are many times when some flexibility with the whole truth and nothing but the truth is called for. And I'll be discussing those later. Outright lying, however, planned lying, lying with an ulterior motive, lying for personal gain, that kind of lying is definitely something to be avoided. But untruthfulness is so tempting today, and I want to spend a little more time on it. I want to make a clear distinction between what I call foolish lying or silly lying or stupid lying and lying that is downright evil and poisonous to the character. Boasting, bombast, blarney, bragging, these are all the same thing. They're always floating around in the atmosphere and they can affect you at any time like catching a cold. They're mostly harmless unless you start building a whole personality around them, which has definitely happened to some people. Some other guy scored the touchdown back in high school, but you're watching the Super Bowl with your neighbor and you say that you did it. That's pretty harmless. You really don't know Joe, the president of XYZ Corporation. You were just introduced to him one time, but the client you're trying to impress has never even shaken hands with Joe. So here's a chance to score some points. That's pretty harmless too. You're not really the creative director of your ad agency, you're the copywriter. But a woman sitting beside you on the plane to Phoenix will never know the difference. It's harmless, unless she walks into your office someday and it's a small world, but you'll chance it. This is all just hot air. This is all going on that old credit card that we were talking about a moment ago. I should mention that there's such a thing as boasting in reverse too. People who flaunt their frugality, people who poor mouth, people who are oppressively ostentatious in their lack of ostentation. This is actually becoming a bit more common. Keep an eye out for it. All of this is childish trash talk and it's usually spontaneous. It comes from succumbing to a moment of social pressure. It's not the kind of behavior that defines strong character, but even strong characters have been known to indulge in it. Ernest Hemingway was a great writer and one of the most powerful personalities of the century. But he could be reckless too. In any case, this kind of bragging and balarney should be distinguished from what I consider real lying. Real lying isn't like putting bills on the credit card. Real lying is like theft. In my opinion, a key element in this kind of real lying is the presence of planning and premeditation. If somebody is a supervisor in a corporation and he steals one of his subordinates' ideas and takes credit for it in the eyes of the CEO, that requires a whole chain of events and a conscious decision to keep the deception going 
to the various links in the chain. That kind of lying is theft. It's not only theft of the subordinate's idea. It's stealing from the CEO, too. It's stealing the CEO's sense of reality. It's creating an illusion. If someone falsifies an earnings report in order to inflate the price of a company's stock, that's deliberately creating a mirage in the minds of the investors. In the real world, both these examples have happened and many times lives and careers have been ruined. It's been my experience that those who engage in serious lying and unethical behavior get caught one way or the other. Usually the people who are being deceived awaken from the illusions that have been foisted upon them. But even if this never happens, the criminal, and I don't think that's too strong a word, has to buy into the illusion so deeply himself that his own sense of reality is eroded. By trying to loosen other people's grasp of the truth, you end up losing your own. All of it, small-time lying and big-time deceit, it all comes from fear. Somebody is afraid the truth about themselves isn't good enough, so they depart from the truth. Somebody secretly fears that they can't really come up with ideas of their own, so they steal somebody else's idea. Or they fear their company isn't really going to succeed, so they come up with a way to inflate the share price. It's really cowards. Remember what we said about courage? Courage is fearing the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Fear the temptation to misrepresent who you are or what you've done or intend to do. Trust who you really are. Trust your ability to earn the respect of others. Pay whatever price the truth costs. Pay that bill immediately. Because in the long run, it's a real bargain. When you're in a leadership position, whether it's in a business or as the head of a family, honesty and integrity are not as important as money or shelter or a telephone. Honesty and integrity are infinitely more important than any of those things. They're about as important as having air and food and water. For a leader, honesty and integrity are absolutely essential to survival. A lot of business people don't realize how closely they're being watched by their subordinates. Remember when you were a kid in grammar school? How you used to sit there staring at your teacher all day? By the end of the school year, I'll bet you could have done a perfect imitation of all your teacher's mannerisms. I'll bet you were aware of the slightest nuances in your teacher's voice. All the little clues that distinguished levels of meaning, that told you the difference between bluff and now I mean business. You were able to do that after eight or nine months of observation. Suppose you had five or ten years. Do you think there would have been anything about your teacher you didn't know? As a manager, there probably isn't anything your people don't know about you right this minute. If you haven't been totally above board and honest with them, it's certain you haven't gotten away with it. But if you've been led to believe that you've gotten away with it, it's most likely because people are afraid of you. That's a problem in its own right. But there's another side of the coin, too. In any organization, people want to believe in their leaders. If you give them reason to trust you, they're not going to go looking for reasons to think otherwise. And they'll be just as perceptive about your positive quality as they are about the negative. I heard a story of a situation that happened some time ago at a company in the Midwest. The wife of a new employee experienced complications in the delivery of a baby. There was a medical bill of more than $10,000, and the health insurance didn't want to cover it. The employee hadn't been on the payroll long enough. The pregnancy was a pre-existing condition, one thing or another. In any case, the employee was desperate. He approached the company CEO and asked him to talk to the insurance people. The CEO agreed, and the next thing the employee knew, the bill was gone. 
the charges were rescinded. But when he mentioned to some colleagues the way the CEO had so readily used his influence with the insurance company, they just shook their heads and smiled. The CEO had paid the bill out of his own pocket, and everybody knew it. No matter how quietly it had been done, an act of dishonesty can't be hidden, and it will instantly undermine the authority of a leader. But an act of integrity is just as obvious to all concerned. When you're in a leadership position, you have the choice of how you will be seen, but you will be seen one way or the other. Make no mistake about that. Leadership of a family demands even higher standards of honesty and integrity. And the stakes are higher too. You can replace disgruntled employees and start over. You can even get a new job for yourself if it comes to that. But your family can't be shuffled like a deck of cards. If you haven't noticed, kids are great moral philosophers, especially as they get into adolescence. They're determined to discover and expose any kind of hypocrisy, phoniness, or lack of integrity on the part of authority figures. And if we're parents, that means us. It's frightening how unforgiving kids can be about this, but it really isn't a conscious decision on their part. It's just a necessary phase of growing up. They're testing everything, especially parents. In Arthur Miller's great play, Death of a Salesman, it's hard to believe that a son would so completely lose faith in his father based on a single incident of dishonesty. Once a parent has lost moral authority, it is very, very difficult to regain it. Studies have shown that children are extremely understanding about many things. If you accidentally step on a favorite toy, that will quickly be forgiven, if not forgotten. If you lose your job and the family has to move, they'll adjust. If parents just can't get along and decide to divorce, most kids can handle it, but they can't handle dishonesty. It can take many, many years before that will be forgiven. Many people keep pictures of their kids on their desk. Is it supposed to be a reminder of what they looked like? Is it showing them off for whoever comes into the office? Well, there is an even more important reason those pictures are there, or why they should be there. They're there to remind us of what's at stake when we make the decisions that determine character. And we all make many of those decisions every day. As a person of integrity yourself, you'll find it easy to teach integrity to your kids, and they in turn will find it easy to accept you as a teacher. This is a great opportunity and also a supreme responsibility because kids simply must be taught to tell the truth, to mean what they say and to say what they mean. There was something interesting about the Indians of the Southwest and the skills they felt were important for their children to know. Hiding was one of them. In a desert environment where you would think there was nowhere at all to hide except possibly by squeezing yourself behind a cactus plant, the Indian children could literally disappear. And running was another very important ability. Beginning as young as six or seven years of age, Indian children were taught to run long distances while holding a mouthful of water in order to develop breath control. And of course, both running and hiding were skills that could save the life of an Indian child as well as preserve the security of the group. Kids today must be taught skills that will save their lives. And integrity is one of those vitally important skills. Maybe it's hard to convince yourself of that. I heard a story of a man who flew propeller-driven anti-submarine planes for the Navy, piloted them on long flights over the water. He told of an incident when a storm was coming up and they were faced with a difficult navigational problem in order to avoid it. The problem became even more difficult when the navigator revealed that he couldn't handle it. He cheated his way through some parts of the training, 
but that training material didn't seem like it would ever be very useful. I can't promise that it will ever save their lives, but nothing you will ever do is more important than teaching integrity to your children. There's an old saying, those who do can and those who can't teach. But you really can't teach honesty unless you are honest yourself. You really can't teach integrity unless you also live with integrity. It's actually quite simple. Earlier I suggested that there might be some times when a certain amount of flexibility with the truth is appropriate. And I'd like to return to that now. It might be tempting for the sake of consistency to assert that you should always tell the whole truth exactly as you see it in every situation. But I've lived long enough in the real world to know things just aren't that simple. Shakespeare wrote of one of his characters, every man has his fault and honesty is his. He is more honest than wise. Just as there is a difference between blowing hot air and premeditated dishonesty, there's also a difference between lying and recognizing the importance of diplomacy. How can you tell the difference? Your gut feelings will tell you. By the time we reach adulthood, I think most of us have extremely accurate ethical barometers built into our heads and hearts. We may choose to ignore what that ethical barometer tells us, but it's there nonetheless. When you're in a leadership role, I believe there's at least one situation in which you're almost always justified in stretching the truth to some degree. And here it is. You should overstate your degree of enthusiasm for your employee's work. You may use many, many carrots and very few sticks. Your recipe for dealing with subordinates should include at least three parts praise for every one part of criticism. Will this stretching of the truth cost you respect? I don't think so. Will a little sugar coating of your true feelings foster greater productivity, better work, and improved morale? Absolutely. And that conclusion is supported by a great deal of behavioral science research. Praise is one of the world's most effective teaching and leadership tools. Criticism and blame even if deserved, are counterproductive unless all other approaches have failed. Vince Lombardi, the late coach of the Green Bay Packers, certainly deserved his reputation as a tough manager and a man of strong character. But even he knew the importance of building up people's ego. You could have seen how this worked if you had the opportunity to attend the practice session of the Packers during the years when they were one of the most powerful football teams ever assembled. Lombardi had a quarterback from his scout team throwing passes against the first string defense. And this young quarterback was obviously eager to impress the coach. But after the player had completed three or four passes in a row, Lombardi seemed anything but impressed. In fact, he seemed quite displeased and he took the scrub quarterback aside. What are you trying to do? Wreck my team? Lombardi snarled. Start throwing interceptions. And you'd better believe he started throwing. We can call it diplomacy or psychology or just plain flattery, but it often brings out the best in people. And it's the grief that keeps the machine of human interaction functioning smoothly. So honesty is the best policy, but sometimes a little less than total honesty is even better. We've been talking mostly about the importance of honesty and integrity in dealing with other people. But I want to conclude now by focusing on what those qualities mean to your relationship with yourself. I think a term from clinical psychology is useful here. The term is cognitive dissonance. And I'll use a quick example to illustrate what it means. Let's consider a man who is an expert on personal financial planning. He makes a good living advising people about life insurance, trust funds, and the various kinds of mortgages. But a great deal of his business is devoted to helping individuals 
who have gotten themselves deeply into debt, who need to tear up their credit cards and start saving instead of spending. Sometimes there is no alternative but declaring bankruptcy and starting over. We are so surprised when one day this expert on personal financial planning says that he is going out of business. I just can't take the pressure anymore. It's too much stress. Well, we can understand that. It must be stressful facing the problems of one person after another who's gotten into trouble financially to work through it with them day in and day out. But here is the big surprise. I'm the one who's in trouble financially, he suddenly admits. I'm behind on everything, even my car payment. And after lecturing about the perils of debt all day, I can't stand to look in the mirror anymore. Wow. This man is experiencing cognitive dissonance in an extreme form. He is trying to live with two conflicting images of himself in his head. And the strain is simply using up all his energy. He's fundamentally a good person. He really believes in doing the right thing. But that's the trouble. He knows he's living a lie. And the stress of that finally gets to him. You might be surprised by the percentage of high-level managers and professional people who secretly know that they're presenting a false image to the world. The need to keep up appearances. The competition with peers. The pressure to make every year better than the last one. All this can make it very tempting to put on a mask. I'm not talking about just boasting here. I'm talking about creating a real split between what you're telling the world and what you know is the real truth about yourself. All the world's a stage, and to some extent we're all playing roles, but living with honesty and integrity can make it all a great deal easier. This is where ethics and psychology really overlap. Not only is it right to minimize cognitive dissonance, in the long run, it's a lot easier on your psyche. We all know people who have gotten ahead as a result of dishonest or unethical behavior. When you're a kid, you think that never happened. But when you get older, you realize that it does. Then you think you've really wised up, but that's not the end of it. When you get older, you see the long-term consequences of dishonest gain, and you realize that it doesn't pay in the end. I've seen people who have made millions with questionable business tactics, and I've also seen a higher percentage of health problems among those people than any insurance actuary could possibly account for. I've seen people who decided to sell out their friends or their business partners in order to cash a big check. And those people wind up looking 20 years older than their age. Stick around, keep your eyes open, and I think you'll see it's true.